Hello, I'm Dale Yurton, and welcome to our study on the life of Joseph. We're looking at three lessons on the life of Joseph. We've dealt with his struggle with pride. He had to overcome the hurdle of pride. Then with pain, the hurdle of pain. And today we're going to look at a third principle. He has to learn how to deal with power in his life. Our text I want to use is in Genesis, the 50th chapter, verses 19 and 20. This is after Jacob's death. Their father, Joseph and his brothers, their father is dead. And now the brothers are afraid Joseph is going to get vengeance upon us. And that was never in the heart of Joseph at all. No, he, was, he overcame that struggle many years ago with his, his struggle with pain. And so it says in Genesis, the 50th chapter, verse 19, Joseph said to them, to his brothers, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Well, that is a powerful question. And we need to remind ourselves of that continually. We're not in the place of God. Never play God, my friend. He goes on to say, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. What, what a powerful concept. And again, he's not just trying to make his brothers feel better. He sincerely believes this. This is his philosophy for life. This is his theology, the way that he believes. And so it brings us to the third hurdle that Joseph has to overcome. The third hurdle, if he's going to reach greatness, grace for greatness, it's the hurdle of power. Power. How do you handle authority? How do you become such a powerful man that the only superpower in the world and you're leading it? How can you do that and not abuse your position? Joseph shows us how. We must learn how to develop the Grace of gentleness within our lives. This is a prayer that I have prayed so many times because it's a weakness that I know that I have within me. And I prayed, oh God, make me a gentleman. A gentleman because that's what I'm not within myself. The only way I can do that is experience the grace of Jesus Christ because Jesus is gentle. Oh, God teach us this lesson, how to deal with power. Now, again, I want to give you four statements here on which I'm going to hang my thoughts to help you remember what I'm going to say. Number one, power is intoxicating. Yes, it is. The more power that you have, the easier it is to go to your head. It changes the way that you think, the way you think about yourself, the way you think about others. Power is intoxicating. Or as, as someone has stated, everything looks different from the top of the mountain. Or oh, that is the truth. Now, I don't know if you're a mountain climber, but I've never seen a mountain I didn't want to climb. And uh, I've climbed many of them. And you get up to the top, oh my, the, the exhilaration, the... the uh, rush of adrenaline. You just, I mean, everything looks different from the top of the mountain. That's where Joseph is. Joseph is in a position of power. He is one of the most powerful men on planet Earth. And nothing reveals what is in our heart like power. When you give someone power, suddenly you find out what they were thinking all the time. You discover what that person really is on the inside. Power reveals that. And so we find Joseph in this position. Now, the truth is, and you, you watch a lot of your Olympic champions, you watch some of your professional players of sports, and you find that many champions are in love with themselves. And when they win, oh my, they're, I'm number one. I mean, and they're boasting in themselves. Jesus didn't do that. 
Joseph didn't do that. How do you keep from falling in love with yourself? You've got to learn how to overcome the temptation of power, the intoxication of power, of what the Bible describes, thinking of yourself above what you ought to think. That brings me to the second thing that I want to talk about. Meekness is the proper use of anger. Now, let me repeat that because you need to get that in your thinking. Meekness is the proper use of anger. Jesus said it best in Matthew 5 and 5. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those that have learned how to properly handle power. Those that have learned the proper use of authority. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, it's, it's an unfortunate thing in the English language that the word meekness rhymes with the word weakness. And there's a lot of people that think it means the same thing. That is not true at all. Meekness is not weakness. No, meekness is power under control. Boy, what a powerful statement. Power under control. That's what Jesus is talking about. Now, of course, you understand that these words were originally written in the Greek language. And in the Greek language, they use different words to illustrate different things. For instance, God commands us to be angry the right way. For instance, in Ephesians 4 and 26, Apostle Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. That's one of the best ways that you can overcome anger is limit the time that you're going to permit yourself to be angry. Limit it, because if you're not careful, you go too far. You begin trying to get vengeance. You begin to try to play God. So to, to be angry, but at the same time, not sin, that reveals a spirit of meekness. Be angry, but do not sin. That's what we're talking about here. Don't let it get out of control. Don't let it go too far. If you're not careful... The devil will take advantage of your passion. He'll take advantage of your anger, and you'll find yourself having to repent over things that you have done you should not have done because of your anger. A good example of that is the life of Christ when he cleansed the temple. He goes in, he makes this whip, and he drives all the animals out. Now notice this. Jesus was angry, but he didn't sin. He didn't go too far. He doesn't start using reviling words. He doesn't start threatening them. No, 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 no. He just simply says, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. This is to be a house of prayer. He cleansed the temple, but he didn't sin. Now that's what we must discover in this word meekness. As I said, this word was written in the Greek language and, and to, to become angry, it's not difficult for us to become angry, but to be angry for the right reason at the right time to the right degree is very difficult. Very difficult for us to get this right. In fact, I think the truth is none of us do get it right unless God helps us. Because for many people, they simply cower down before those that have done them wrong, and the abuse continues. As it's well said, abusive, abusive people will continue to abuse you until you stop them. And that is so true. But on the other hand, people that are very passionate have a lot of fire inside of them. If they're not careful, they go too far the other way. They begin playing God, and they are out of bounds now. They need to repent for what they're doing. So this is what we're talking about with meekness. Being angry for the right reason at the right time to the right degree. This is 
what the word meekness means. Now, this brings me to the third point I want to use. Meekness is developed by proper submission to authority. You recognize you are not the ultimate authority. And that's what Joseph says. Joseph said, I may be the prime minister of Egypt. I may be the most powerful man in the room. But I am not God. I'm not in the place of God. God help us never to forget that. No, what, no matter what the authority is that we have received in our life, there's always someone that is above us, someone to whom we are accountable. So meekness is developed by proper submission to authority. This, this Greek word that's translated meekness, it was, it was used in three different types of situations among the Greeks. The Greek-speaking people would use this word meekness when they talked about ranchers taming an animal. Take, take a great animal like a horse, and it's so powerful. It can run much faster than you. It's stronger than you are. But when you have tamed that animal to your command, they would say you have meeked the animal. It was also used for doctors curing a disease, a disease that had the potential of destroying you, of killing you, and yet they were able to cure that disease. And the Greek-speaking people would say they have meeked the disease. The third way that it was used was by sailors. Sailors sailing in the seas and the winds and the waves. If they're able to harness the wind, then the sailors would say, we have meeked the wind. We have brought it under our control, our authority. That's what Jesus is talking about. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, Joseph. Joseph understands that God is the ultimate authority. That's, he said, I'm not in the place of God. No, God always has the last word. Every deed is either an act of obedience or it is an act of disobedience toward God. Everything that we do or say, it all ultimately comes to God. Joseph understood that. The Apostle Paul understands that, and this is a classic verse dealing with this subject. In Romans 13 and 1, where he's, Paul says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So when we get into rebellion, we are ultimately rebelling against God. Joseph came to some remarkable revelation. It's, I remember the first time this thought hit my mind, and I'm thinking, wow, is that really true? I believe it is. Joseph believed he was serving God by serving Pharaoh. I believe Daniel felt the same way. He was serving God by serving Nebuchadnezzar. They understood authority. And they recognize this person is put in that position of authority. It's my responsibility to respond in the right way. So Joseph is serving God by serving Pharaoh. That's what meekness is all about. Meekness is, is learning how to take power and bring it under control. Take the mighty winds, conquer the wind. Take the, the deadly disease and conquer the disease. Or take the huge animal like the elephant. And they're able to train the elephant to obey their command. They have meeked the animal. Now, here's the fourth point that I want to talk about. Our proper response to authority increases our own authority. Let me repeat that. Our proper response to authority increases our own authority. That's what happens in the life of Joseph. And because Joseph gets this right, 
God continues to elevate him from position to position to position to greater responsibilities. It was one of the problems that his brothers had had when Joseph was at home. They knew their father intended to make Joseph the leader of the family. And they resented that because he's the baby boy. He was born after I was. And so how can he become our head? How can he become our leader? But the same principle continued to apply. And the reason that that happened in Joseph's family is because Joseph was the one that was really pleasing his father. And I believe even though he was very young, his intention was good. He had a good spirit. He had a good heart. He meant well. You find when he is sent to Egypt, though, as a slave, he masters that as a slave. In Genesis, the 39th chapter, in verse 4, it said, So Joseph found favor in his sight, his master Potiphar, and he served him. Then he, Potiphar, made him, Joseph, overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. Wow! So this doesn't just work at home. That's where he learned it, dealing with his father. But now he's ruler of his master's house. Potiphar has put him lord over his house. And it's one of those uh, funny statements in the Bible. I don't know if you laugh when you read your Bible. But sometimes I read things. I say, that is so true. It said of Potiphar, Potiphar didn't know anything going on in his house. He didn't know what was happening except for the food that was on his plate. That's all he really knew that was taking place. He trusted Joseph. And because Joseph was handling authority properly, correctly, it said he served him. Because he was doing this, he is made ruler over his master's house. Now, when you come to the end of the 39th chapter, you find another verse, verse 22, where it says, the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. Now, notice this. He's not just ruler over his master's house. He's ruler over the prison house. Joseph understands authority. And because he served his master, he became ruler of his master's house. Because now he is serving the keeper of the prison. He's placed in authority over the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. Wow, this man understands authority. He's overcoming the hurdle of power. The third thing that I find is in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 41, where it says of Pharaoh, Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Now he's the ruler of Egypt. How powerful is that? This man, because he understands authority. If we will understand authority and submit to the proper authorities, It increases power within our own lives. We're properly using authority. We're properly handling power. And because of this, God is able to elevate us to greater and greater positions. It's because Joseph was under authority that his own personal power to lead and rule was increased. He is increasing because... He's properly handling authority. Now, here's a thought I want to leave with you. And that is, Joseph delivers Egypt and the surrounding nations, which included Canaan, where his father and brothers were, where his family was located. He delivers Egypt and the surrounding nations from his number two position. Now, that is very important to understand. Because there are so many people, all they want is a number one position. I want to be number one. Joseph did not, never attempted to become number one. It was a number two position. Favor always was greater than Joseph. God, of course, was above them all. 
But Pharaoh said, you will be the greatest man in the land next to me. You're going to rule in my place. And he gave him the authority to do that. He delivers Egypt from a number two position. In Genesis 41 in verse 40, Pharaoh said, you shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Now those are the words of Pharaoh to Joseph. But don't you understand? That's the plan of salvation. That's the plan of redemption. That is exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus said, my father is greater than I. Jesus would say, not my will, but yours be done. Submitting himself to the will of his father. It's because he was able to do that and do it so correctly, so perfectly, that God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Jesus, speaking of himself and his position in life, in the book of John chapter 5 and verse 30, Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now those are the words of Jesus. He is describing his ministry. He's describing the way that he operates, his philosophy, his theology. This is the way I live in submission to my Father. Again, in John the 14th chapter and verse 28, Jesus said, you have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. And if you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. Listen to the words of Jesus. He willingly submits himself to the will of his Father. Now the Apostle Paul writes about this in the book of 1 Corinthians the 15th chapter and verse 28. He's talking now about the end of time. He's talking about the grand finale. When, when it's all finished, now when all things are made subject to him, Jesus Christ is talking about, then the Son himself will be subject to him, God the Father, who put all things under him, Jesus Christ, that God may be all in all. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, the way that I have redeemed you, I've redeemed you from the number two position. Why did he do that? Because Jesus understood this was the root problem of sin in the world. It came out of rebellion. Sin is always an act of rebellion against the authority of God. Sin is saying, I want my way. I want what I want. Redemption says, not my will, but yours be done. That's the way that Jesus lived. That's the way that he operated. That's the way that he redeemed us. The same way that Joseph redeemed not only Egypt, but also his own family. And that's the way that Jesus redeemed the world from the number to position. By submitting himself and saying, not my will, but yours be done. Now, I, I, I pray that these words speak to your heart, that you get this in your thinking, my friend, that you stop trying to be number one. That is a trap of sin. It's a trap that Satan uses against us, trying to be number one. We want to be first. No, no, no. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then learn humility. Those that humble themselves experience great honor. Before honor comes humility. Now, I remember hearing a message, one of the great messages I've heard in my life is, what do you do when you realize that you are the most powerful person in the room? Well, the greatest example, of course, of all is the example of Jesus Christ. There was no greater example than Christ. What do you do when you realize 
You are the most powerful person in the room. Do what Joseph did. Joseph humbled himself and he said, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to serve you. Do what Jesus did. Jesus did exactly the same thing. It's, it's a beautiful passage of scripture found in the book of John, the 13th chapter and verses 1 through 5. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. That's the way Jesus did it. When Jesus, knowing that he was the most powerful man in the room, knowing that he was above all, he humbled himself and served them, and in so doing became the redeemer Deemer, the Savior of the world. That's what Joseph did. Because Joseph properly handled authority, God brought him out of prison, not only to reign, but also to save, to deliver, to feed those that had done him wrong. That's truly grace for greatness. And that's what God wants to do in every one of our lives for us to reach our potential for which God has created us.